Tunisia holds its first free elections. It's a day that we thought would never arrive. And Egypt prepares for its own. Muammar Gaddafi's reign is brought to a bloody conclusion. North African countries can see a light at the end of the tunnel. Tunisia was born again today. But Syria and Yemen are experiencing dark days. So what future for the Arab revolutions? This is Empire. Hello and welcome to Empire. I am Marwan Bishara. The seasons have turned on the Arab Revolution. The Arab Spring in Tunisia and Egypt has given way to heated summer in Libya, Syria and Yemen, leading to the deaths of tens of thousands with no end in sight. The violent crackdown, the militarization of the revolutions and the international intervention in Libya have derailed the popular uprisings from their original trajectory and could lead to full-blown civil wars with spillover effects to neighboring countries. Will Syria and Yemen follow in the footsteps of Libya, or is there another way out? Well, joining me to discuss the future of the region are Nadia Al Ali, Professor of Gender and Postcolonial Studies at London University School of Oriental and African Studies, and author of Secularism, Gender and State in the Middle East, among many other titles. Professor Radwan Ziadi, founder and director of the Damascus Center for Human Rights Studies, visiting professor at Harvard University, and a member of the newly formed Syrian National Council. And filmmaker, writer, and journalist Neil Rosen has just returned from Yemen and Syria, author of Aftermath, Following the Bloodshed of America's Wars in the Muslim World. And last but not least, Shemes Milne, columnist and associate editor at The Guardian newspaper and author of The Enemy Within. But first, let's take a closer look at the latest balance sheet from Syria. Many predicted Syria would be different, saying their president, Bashar al-Assad, was actually popular in much of the country. The Arab world isn't enough for you. You should lead the entire world, Mr. President. Many were wrong. Traitor! Bashar al-Assad is a traitor! The Assad family dynasty has ruled Syria for more than four decades. Basha inherited a personality cult from his father, Hafez al-Assad, but there was another pattern passed down from father to son, ruthlessly crushing any opposition. The country has been under a state of emergency for almost half a century, but when Syrian forces cracked down hard on a small incident in the southern town of Daraa, the fuse was lit. Demonstrations spread across the country as calls for reform gradually turned into calls for the downfall of the regime. For the Syrians expecting real concessions, President Assad's defiance was the last straw. Syria now is being subjected to a strong conspiracy, as are other parts of the world. There's been a wave of popular uprisings. They all affect Syria. While many of the demonstrators were unarmed and non-violent, some were prepared to fight. At first it was disorganized, but as members of the military defected, there was a more organized armed opposition conducting ambushes, attacking checkpoints, and defending the demonstrators. Now, after six months, the rebellion is deadlocked. So what could uh, tip the balance internally in terms of the use of force is if we see some cracks with, within the Syrian military, Syrian security, uh, within the th Syrian regime. The UN's top human rights official has warned of a full-blown civil war. I'm watching with great dismay how the numbers of people who were killed has increased. It's now 3,000. The reason why the uprising has failed to catch fire is sectarian divisions between the opposition who fear the alternative Islamic rule, communal violence between Sunnis and Alawites only inflames the situation. Meanwhile, the Syrian political opposition is divided. 
with the two main rival groups undermining each other. International pressure is building. Bashar has lost the support of his close friends and neighbors in Qatar and Turkey, and now the US has weighed in, withdrawing its ambassador, calling for Assad to step down. The world has borne witness to the Assad regime's contempt for its own people. This morning, President Obama called on Assad to step aside and announced the strongest set of sanctions to date targeting the Syrian government. The sanctions that have been imposed will do little to weaken the regime, and President Assad is warning of an earthquake that would burn the whole region if the West does intervene. International involvement, as long as it's peaceful, would be perfectly acceptable. We have no problem with that. But if it's a matter of violence and military intervention, airstrikes on our military and air force, then we have a problem. For now, it appears the government and its supporters are as stubborn as the opposition. Some dictators in the region have fled or wound up in prison. Others have decided to fight to the bitter end. With few options, Bashar al-Assad is facing a difficult choice. Neil, you've just come back uh, from Syria. You've written extensively. And you mainly concentrated on militarization and sectarianism. I think uh, sectarianism is almost inevitable given the events in the region. There's a regional war within the Muslim world happening between Sunnis and Shias. Uh, beginning in Iraq, in the American invasion of Iraq, which created a Sunni-Shia civil war, the uh, assassination of Hariri, the execution of Saddam, um, the Hezbollah victory o over Israel, which sort of made the Saudis want to go to war against Hezbollah by demonizing them as Shiites. Um, King Abd Abdullah of Jordan talking about a Shia crescent. K uh, Mubarak of Egypt talking about uh, Shiites being traitors. Mm -hmm. Culminating with Bahrain, the Saudi invasion of Bahrain to suppress an uprising which was to them like this big Shia threat. So it was almost inevitable that events in Syria would be seen through the sectarian prism because you have a majority Sunni country and a majority Sunni opposition battling a government which they're portraying as an Alawite government. Do you think it is an Alawite government, an Alawite regime, or it's, more it's a regime that has Alawites at its core? Obviously, the ruling family has been Alawite for the last 40-something years, uh, but it's more an Alawite-dominated security force married to a Sunni business class. Um, many of the, of the top people in the regime are Sunni, or, or Christian for that matter. But it's inevitable that it's being seen by both sides increasingly through a sectarian divide. Radwan, do you see that going that way? That there's a, more of a sectarian, a new sectarianism? No. A on? As soon the international community is not intervening and helping to stop the killings committed by the Assad regime, we'll see more possibilities to have civil war in Syria. How can and the international uh, community help in which way? I, by, by, by different ways. Until now, it has been eight months, and the Security Council was unable to take any actions, to adopt resolution, mm -hmm. to, uh, to refer the crimes against the humanity to the International Criminal yeah, but Court. But how will this end the violence, specifically? What can the UN do? I mean, all, all the, it's, it's, uh, now the, the uprising in 2011 in Syria different than the uprising in the 80s, which much more was, uh, was sectarian Muslim brothers against, uh, against the, the Assad regime at that time. Yeah, but what can this they is, do, specifically? This is, this is widespread demonstrations in, in all over the countries only uh, 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 all in, in, in all places. So you're not worried about increased sectarianism in the country because of violence? I, I, I'm worried if, this is, if, if, if the uprising lasts much more time, because this is much more possibilities, because the regime is investing on the civil war, uh, creating fear among, among the Alawite community that will be massacred. So if, you think if, if this is in favor of the regime, sectarianism in the country today? This is the question. Uh, this is mm. the, the sectarianism is not favor in the country. Not I in favor in our nation. I think that's a this real is, tension, actually. We have to actually. understand that. Yeah. But at the same time, it, it, the regime is investing on that. The main source of the Shabiha, unfortunately, is the Arawite the community. The thugs, you mean? The thugs. It's, it's uh, the Arawite community. Well, not and in Aleppo. In Aleppo, all the, the pro-government thugs are from Sunnis. From tribes. From tribes yeah. and different tribes. But, I mean, this is it, ha, how it has been seen. Yeah. And all the videos, all the victims, the overwhelming of the victims are Sunni. And over overwhelming of the murders... <laughs> Are, are, are Alawite. How to avoid that? How oh. to avoid that by the international community taking an actions and enforce Bashar Assad to step down? How? how because how? because b because the, 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 the Assad family they link linked their their family in, in power with the Alawite community. 
they should the Alawite community take in distance from the Assad family because now the only the, the only goal for the protesters on the ground for the Assad step down there is no sectarian any any of sectarian sectarian uh, 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 slogans or sectarian banners in all of the protest and they so you think it's more implicit yeah it's and, not taking any explicit and they're manifestation Alawite, they're Alawite victims they're Alawite victims has been killed by the security and we know any Alawite have been actually defected in the army will be punished much more stronger than others. Uh, actually, Seamus, uh, Nir started by saying that um, sectarianism in the region has an, uh, an overspill or spillover to Syria. But that also is going to have now the opposite effect. I mean, Syria is going to have quite an effect on Iraq, Lebanon, and so on and so forth if sectarianism goes trans transregional or well, of course. I mean, Syria is part of a, of a region which has been, as Nia said, infused with this sectarian spirit since, in particular, the American invasion uh, of Iraq. And, I mean, I find it hard to understand how any kind of Western intervention, and when we're talking about the so-called international community, we're talking about the Western powers overwhelmingly, that any kind of Western intervention in the Syrian conflict and confrontation can in any way lessen uh, sectarianism. All the experience in the region, historically over the last hundred years with the Western powers uh, colonialism in the region, but also since in multiple interventions, all that experience shows that such interventions exacerbate and increase sectarianism, not lessen it. Now, that doesn't solve the problem, but I think it's a, a very important warning no. to people in Syria who are calling for I'm, foreign I'm, intervention. I'm, I'm, I'm no, just one, one second. Uh, Nadia, from your work on mm. secularism, mm. do you think sectarianism and violence are basically interrelated? I actually see a dilemma. I see a dilemma that um, I can actually understand your perspective, but I, from my perspective, as someone who has sort of followed very closely what's happening in Iraq, I'm very, very dubious about any kind of positive outcome of any form of foreign intervention. But at the same time, I mean, I was also, I mean, I, uh, when it came to the invasion of Iraq, I was debating with relatives inside Iraq who at the time were divided over this. So I understand that, you know, it's easier for us they're in a way. They're not divided now, though, are they? No, they're not divided exactly, now, but it took a long time. Once exactly. they've had the experience, they've seen what that yes, can lead yes, to. That's, that's, the, that's, that's the, the lesson that's that has to be learned. Exactly. The, the situation in Syria like this, we have the power of the people, which actually the people, they reach the, the, the non-retain point. But at the same time, they cannot get the momentum, they cannot achieve to topple the Assad regime. Uh, and the other power, actually, the security with the army. As the situation continue like this, none of them they can prevail. This is why much more possibility to have civil war, because overwhelming the victims are Sunni, and the overwhelming of the criminals and murderers are Alawite from the security. As the situation continue goes on, this is the possibility to have civil war. My impression is that neither the opposition nor the regime has sufficiently a uh, large level of support in the country really to prevail. I mean, the opposition clearly has very substantial support, but not enough to prevail if yeah, it was in a... And the regime yeah. clearly, yeah. clearly yeah. has how a social can, base, ha clearly has a social base which has allowed the, the it to Assad, survive. The Assad did not stop the killing sin ma since March 17. Yeah. But how to, how to prevent going to the civil war if, if the international community committed to say that the Assad has no chance to stay in power because the, the problem... How can that be enforced without military power? Uh, this is the question of the international community. What can they do short of military intervention? No, it's, it's two ways. The first, uh, it has the Security Council to start with the resolution, put sanctions on Bashar al-Assad and other security officers and refer the crimes against the humanity to the International Criminal Court. Then they have another reason to never step down, though. They know if they step down, no, they're the, finished. What, what was I, the record I, of that in Iraq I, before, before I 2003? Don't was in it this successful? Argument. No, no. If there is no international interference of whatever kind, do you see militarization of the opposition taking place de facto because of defections from the army? I saw it myself. I mean, I actually met with, military, uh, with opposition military commanders in, in the Homs and Rastan area. But I think it's misleading to talk about the people because Syria is so divided among different groups of people. But certainly among the opposition supporters within Syria, there was a growing realization during Ramadan, so during August, that peaceful demonstrations are not going to overthrow this regime. And they began to call for uh, armed international intervention. But even before that, by uh, July, there were armed attacks against security forces, ambushes. You had people defending demonstrations. You also had people initiating attacks against security forces in parts of the is country. Is that increasing? That's been increasing. On the chart, you, do you see it going up? 
it's an increasing trend, and we also see villagers and slum dwellers, people who already have access to weapons, using weapons to defend themselves. The security forces come into a neighborhood, they're met with fire from uh, some of the young guys who happen to have guns. So it's not very organized, but you also have a very organized phenomenon developing of ex-army officers and uh, enlisted men. What's amazing about this, uh, Nadia, in the, in the Syrian oppositions, there are so many women leaders. But in places like Libya, where there's violence, mm. and in places like Syria, yeah. the more the violence, the, more the, the less the role. Step, yes, exactly. So how, how do you see that well, then translating? Well, that's, I mean, a big concern for me, and that's why I'm uh, not very optimistic with respect to Libya, for example, what I've seen. And also, now I'm get worried hearing about the militarization of, of the whole um, process. I think that there is a relationship between the militarization of a society and gender-based violence. The more militarized the society is, the more we find violence against women and the more women are marginalized. That's something not unique to the Middle East. That's something that actually historically and cross-culturally happened everywhere. And I see that also happening or unfolding in certain contexts now. And, and uh, Radwan, one of the positive things about Syria is that it has this pluralistic society. So what are you doing at the Syrian National Council and the opposition to make sure that the council is representative of the society and of the various sections of the society that we spoke about earlier? We don't have a, a national council depends on the sixth group. Rather than we, we, we look, we have all the political and the social powers in Syria and the Damascus Declaration, the Muslim Brothers, the, the Kurdish political parties and the, the independents and all others, intellectuals and the activists, we say that we, 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 we will have actually uh, an umbrella for the opposition, which is called the Syrian National Council. But every political party has to put the, the different ethnic groups in consideration. Mm. Syria, so you don't want quotas, but you do want something that's representative. Exactly. Why isn't Aleppo and Damascus fully involved in the revolution as others? Well, there's two arguments that could be made for why, and I, th I think it's and these important. are almost one third of that. Uh, uh, this is more than one third of the population of the country, um, and the most important cities in the country, the capital and the economic center. Um, you could argue that the security forces have been very smart about preventing demonstrations from happening, which is certainly part of the reason. But also, this is where much of the wealth of the country is, and, and the business class, and they're inherently conservative, and they would rather maintain their life that they have now than venture into the unknown. Um, and they've, uh, I, I spoke to many Sunni uh, regime supporters in Aleppo, and they have been disillusioned by the opposition. They say, even if we don't like Bashar, we're afraid of this opposition. It's Islamist, maybe, or it's the, the, the violence kind of scares them. Their fear of, these, of a civil war and of sectarianism, and they prefer the decent life they have now, which, if you have money, is actually quite good. Are you scary? No, no, no. no. Do you think scary. we should be scared of the Senior National Council? No, but I, what I'd be interested to know is what your strategy is to uh, advance without civil war, because it seems to me your only uh, approach is to say we must have foreign intervention. And I mean, for, the, for, for many people in the region and beyond, we've seen that that can have disastrous consequences. No, no. Why not peaceful protest? Because that's the whole magic of the Arab no, Revolution. No. Why, that's how it succeeded in Tunisia, Tunisia and Egypt, and perhaps Egypt. in Yemen. Yeah, I'm not in favor of military intervention. Uh, uh, are, you, are you in favor of militarizing the revolution? No, no, no. One of the principles of the Sina revolution against mil any military intervention. And in all the opposition conferences in June, in, in, in May, in June, in Antalya, in Cairo, in yeah. other places, against any military intervention. But then look to the regime, what's happened, more killings, and the way they've been torturing the people, they feel the security officer, they are immune. So, so, so has the position changed now? Of course. It's in favor of uh, international intervention? The people they calling actually for no fly zone, no fly zone is kind of military intervention. I get uh, very dubious when I hear the people. Um, I mean, in no country I you mean have the protesters. They no, no. You have yeah. protesters yeah. in, right. in 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 one in one hundred fifty nine cities right. and yes. and villages in Syria. All of them re raising banners, no fly zone. I don't think it's surprising at all that sections of the Syrian opposition have turned 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 to armed resistance given the level of repression that there's been in the yeah, country. Sure. But the question is, you know, from, from the point of view of the opposition, what strategy is that going to lead to from the point of view of, of getting change in Syria, getting the kind of society you want? Um, and it seems to me that the logic of everything you've said is that the only way, the only path out of that is foreign intervention. Exactly what 
what you're saying, people are being pushed towards calling for a no-fly zone, which is a polite term for aerial bombardment, as we've seen it's not in, flying, Li in I Libya. Mean, I mean, there has been mass repression in Yemen as well, uh, but I don't see the opposition there calling for foreign intervention. But there are military, it's becoming well, course, militarized yeah. in well, Yemen. Of course, well. in, in Yemen, the, the Americans are already intervening and have done for some time the in support of the, the government. the people who have been killed in Yemen, the number of the people who have helped king in Syria. So how many? 3,000? Well, in, no, in, no, in, in, in Yemen, it's getting... No, in Syria, 3,000. We do believe the number is much, much higher. And let's you think with intervention it will decrease or no, increase? No, let's have I mean, in Yemen, it's getting close to 2,000. Let's have small comparison. During 18 days Egyptian revolution, the human rights organization confirmed that 230, 250 have been killed in Egypt during these 18 years. Mm -hmm. Where Egypt, they have strong human rights no, no, organization. They have Al Jazeera on a Tahrir Square, which is the God's eye. They protect the protesters on the ground. Syrian, we have none of that. None mm -hmm. of that. And it has been seven months. Th and, and, and this is why co the, the armed council in Egypt then confirmed later on that the people who have been killed is 822. This is why we get only 5% of the real situation on the ground of, of the people. Yesterday, the, 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 the report of the Amnesty International, how the people have been killed inside the hospitals. This is the, the everyday so, life of the, the Syrians. What's the point of a no-fly zone if there's no flying? I mean, the, the, the Syrian Air Force is not involved in, in the suppression of the uprising. No, they, so what will a no-fly zone accomplish? We know that a no-fly zone is in fact an armed intervention yeah. from Bombing. the air. Gentlemen, Nadia, we're going to need to take a news break. Before we do, here's a recap of the recent events in Libya. It has been a long time coming, but Libya is at last starting a new chapter. The mood here is one of elation. Our happiness is not just for Libya, but for all the Muslim world, all Arabs. We are happy, by God so happy, for our people and our men. Western leaders, by contrast, elected for a more sober reaction. Today is a day to remember all of Colonel Gaddafi's victims. This marks an era the end of an era of despotism. This is only the end of the beginning. The road ahead for Libya and its people will be difficult and full of challenges. The first of those challenges will be to disarm the fighters who are now more familiar with bullets than ballots in order to fashion a new military. Libya will need a massive reconstruction program to rebuild the battle-scarred country. But forging a completely new political and social landscape will be equally challenging. The National Transitional Council seems aware of its own limits, especially since none of its members will be allowed to participate in the elections next year. Unlike Egypt and Tunisia, Libya now has to wipe the slate clean to purge all traces of the regime from society. That approach is not without its own blessings and curses especially as the psychological scars might prove hard to heal in a society that has been at war with itself. But if they succeed, it will prove a vivid example to countries like Syria and Yemen still struggling for freedom. For those countries, this inspiration can't come quickly enough. Welcome back. It's like a fairy tale. Who would have imagined last November that Tunisia would hold its first free elections within a year and that Nahda, the Islamist party the former dictator called a destructive, danger on democracy, terrorist, and corrupting, would win two-fifths of the vote, underline its commitment to democracy, and express its willingness to form a coalition government with secular parties? Twice this year, Tunisians have done what once seemed impossible. In their first ever free elections, this new electorate has just demonstrated an overwhelming commitment to democracy. It's a day that we thought would never arrive. The Jasmine Revolution inspired millions to take to the streets and join the Arab Spring. Now, this election shows what to do once the regimes have been removed. In the same way we understood the Tunisian Revolution, it served as an inspiration to other countries, Egypt, Libya, and now Yemen, and also Syria. Uh, the success of the democratic elections in Tunisia, though, I think they will serve as another form of inspiration. And for many here, they are all too aware that the difficult work is just beginning. In Tunisia, what you've got, you've got a 
political class, uh, political elites, who begin now <clears throat> a process of apprenticeship, democratic apprenticeship. And it's not hard to understand why. From the moment it won independence in 1956 until January this year, Tunisia has been ruled by just two men. Both Habib Bourguiba and Zinedine Ben Ali promised an open, largely secular and free society. Yet both manipulated the system, imprisoned their opponents, and rigged elections to stay in office. This helps explain why the children of those early days of promise became the grandparents taking to the streets in this year's protest. And yet it is recent history which must be confronted first. The legacy of the Ben Ali regime must be dealt with, and Tunisians must decide how to engage with countries who were once all too happy to befriend the regime. There is really a narrative there that's been hidden, um, the, the endorsement for a long time by lots of Western regimes or governments you know, to uh, the Ben Ali uh, dictatorship. And while those countries deal with the embarrassment of their past behavior inside Tunisia, the emphasis will be on the immediate challenges. Among them will be reconciling political and cultural differences, or at least setting them aside for the time being, in the interests of what's best for the country. Parties like Inahda are now in the spotlight. During Ben Ali's reign, it was banned, many of its members imprisoned and tortured. But with these results, it now holds the balance of power and is responsible for constructing a working coalition. Tunisia was born again today. The Arab Spring was born again today. Not in a negative way, like the toppling of a dictator, but in a positive way, a way that represents the people. Outside of the country, many worry about its intentions and whether it is truly committed to democratic ideals. But that just shows, say experts, why outsiders are getting it wrong once again. This is the first time that Anahda leaders face the real world by taking real responsibility. Whether they will be up to it or not, we hope that they will be up to it. But I think, I hope they will do it with the others. They will not do it by themselves because they will not be able to do it by themselves. In the West, everyone is obsessed with the Muslim Brotherhood and, and Nahda. I think it is their right to make mistakes, to sharpen their political skills, and also to be subjected you know, to the grilling of society so that they are forced to moderate you know, their politics. The reason many inside this country feel confident that this first step toward democracy will succeed is the fact that the Jasmine Revolution itself was not ideological. It was the Tunisian people's revolution. That's why nowadays uh, all the political parties, they confess, everybody in the country, they confess that it, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't done by them. They contributed to the revolution, but it was done by the Tunisian people of all age groups, of all genders, of all political um, um, uh, parties. What's essential, they say, is not forgetting why they took to the streets in the first place. When politics takes over, you know, you are actually um, neutralizing the revolution. And really what you need, you need actually almost a segment of the populace to remain the keepers of the moral flame. Seamus, so we've seen a report on Tunisia and on Libya. What is the lesson for Syria, Yemen, and the international community in terms of intervention, outside intervention in Libya? Well, I think, you know, the outcome of the Tunisian elections shows the positive face of what's called the Arab Spring, where people have been able to express uh, the popular will, a party which stands for some sort of progressive Islamism, social justice, um, and national independence has been elected with the largest number of votes. Now, of course, the Bin Ali regime still has its fingers in, or the, the successors of it still have its fingers in the society. There's still many problems. They effectively control the state. There are outside forces, including Saudi Arabia, intervening in the process right now. So there are counter-revolutionary forces in Tunisia. But obviously, right now, it's the most hopeful fruit of that uh, Arab Spring. And the Libyan experience, I would say, is the ugliest and most unsuccessful. Um, because if uh, what people were looking for with foreign intervention in Libya, as they claimed they were, was to protect civilian lives, then it has been clearly a catastrophic failure. You don't buy into the argument that it could have been worse 
if the international community did not intervene? Well, obviously we can't know that, just as we can't know whether when Gaddafi's troops uh, were in March, were outside Benghazi, what would have happened if there hadn't been an intervention. What we see going on daily in Libya now, which is mass ethnic cleansing, torture, mass detentions, uh, the destruction of an entire city in the, in the case of Sirte, you know, killings of prisoners in the most horrific manner, and very large numbers of civilian casualties. I don't think anyone can seriously say that's a success in its own terms. And when it comes to the future of Libya, I think the danger is that Libyans have lost control of their own country, that the Western powers that intervened you know, hold many of the key strings and will not let it go lightly. And there's going to have to be a battle now if Libyans want to take back their future uh, to do that. Radwan, that doesn't bode well, does it, for a scenario of intervention in, in Syria? No, I don't like the debate to be that we are in against or in favor the military intervention because no one likes to have military intervention in his own country. Mm. Of course, this is an, uh, obvious. But the question that's how to stop the killings. They tried in different ways. They go to the street by large critical numbers. And the only response, response by the Assad regime, the life ammunition. Right they, I, I, with respect, I mean, I completely see your point. There is a problem about how to stop the killings. But what we're absolutely clear about after Libya is that that is not the way to stop the killings because it multiplied them by a very large number so that foreign military intervention leads to disaster. The only way to stop the killings is to use force to prevent the forces being used against the protesters. Well, that's not what happened in Libya. The use of force externally through a no-fly zone, so-called, actually led to the deaths of tens of thousands of people. So that didn't work. It, of, of course, worked in terms of overthrowing the regime. And if that's what, that was the intention, it was successful. But the question then is, will Libyans control because their own future? But it certainly didn't stop killing. No. There's no similarity between Libya and Syria. Uh, I mean, you had Benghazi in Libya. You had a big part of the country, which was far away from the capital thousand kilometers controlled by the opposition and they had their own militias um, so they had a staging point and NATO was willing to interfere and NATO is not going to be bombing Syria um, and there's not even a pretext of um, Syrian aircraft bombing civilians that which would warrant an no-fly zone so there's no place in Syria where the opposition can kind of have its armed base um, there's no international desire whatsoever to come close to Syria. Uh, the Americans have the Iraq experience behind them. There's no nearby bases they could use. I think Turkey is the most likely foreign actor which will intervene at some point, maybe a year or two down the line. But uh, it's just silly to look for comparisons. I will say that... But that would be disastrous, no less. Mm -hmm. Probably, and it's going to take some big pretext. Maybe once the civil war kicks off, or there's m a, a very large massacre, um, or a lot of humanitarian displacement, which is, I think, quite far off still. I think, though, we do have to acknowledge that most of the Syrian opposition on the ground would welcome, the opposition would welcome military intervention of one kind or another, and they're actually hoping for it and asking for it. Now, do you want I to mean, think that back? Well, I mean, for me, I have another concern or an added concern, which is, um, I mean, the images that I've seen, um, for me, from my perspective, uh, very much men fighting arms with uh, other men fighting with arms. And um, in the process, you know, accounts of uh, African migrant workers being targeted. Um, actually, in Tripoli, there were documented cases of um, female migrant workers being raped by the rebels. So, for me, in terms of you know thinking the future, in terms of just uh, equal society where women play a role, this doesn't forebode very well. I mean, there's such a heightened violence, and I also again thinking sectarianism is not an issue in Libya, but in terms of the division in society along tribes, in terms of different regions, I'm very worried. Why wouldn't Syria go on the footsteps of Tunisia rather than Libya? I can assure you that all, not only in Syria, in, in, in Yemen, also in Libya, they would prefer to go in Tunisian model. One of the problems why Syria has much more difficult situation than in Libya because the Assad is using the full capacity of the army suppressing the people, mm. which I think B Bashar al-Assad, if, if, if Bashar al-Assad should be held accountable because he's destroying the, uh, the Syrian army, which much needed as a national institution for the future. For the future. But near, the sense is, if you, if you take a bit of a distance, the last seven months, despite the, perhaps the gloominess of, of course, the death and so on and so forth, and that's very important, but certainly the Syrian opposition have made a major uh, strides forward over the last seven months. Sure, and uh, within Syria, it's actually remarkable. 
people of, of all sides of the political spectrum, even regime supporters, speak openly now in a way they never did before. And we see civil society initiatives in homes, for example, between opposition supporters and regime supporters um, to sort of settle their own differences and try to prevent a civil war. Things which you never, we never imagined under the, under the Ba'athi regime before, um, let alone the opposition people who are now suddenly speaking openly and freely. Um, so the, the, the Syrian personality has almost changed, and people now speak openly and more freely than they ever have since uh, the regime took over. But they, so, so they, they are, failed. there is a positive evolution going on in the well, Syrian society and in the Syrian opposition. At the same time, we see this growing sectarian trend yes. and, and a growing thirst for, for vengeance. And actually, communal violence mm -hmm. is happening in some parts of Homs and Hama, which really reminds me of the early days of the Iraqi civil war. Let's take it away from sectarianism into the more uh, uh, macro picture, if you will. Uh, you've been recently recognized by your fellow uh, Transitional National Council in Libya, and you've been there, I, I suppose, I yeah. uh, last week. First of all, Seamus, when will they, uh, Europeans and others, recognize the uh, Syrian National Council? Now, al Nahda, of course, is celebrated in Europe and other places as uh, the legitimate representative. What stops the international community from look, taking a serious look at the representation in Syria? Who is this international community? I mean, this phrase, international community, I think <laughs> is a very problematic one. Yes. But I, if you're talking about the Western states, I mean, I, I, I don't think there's any, there should be any question of recognizing the Syrian opposition, and there shouldn't be any question of recognizing any um, political group, whether I'm sympathetic with it or opposed to it. If it I mean, it would, when you're talking about recognition, you're talking about people who control territory um, and are effective you know, power authority in that country. I mean, what's happened in, in the case of the relations between Libya and the Syrian opposition is a purely political posturing. It has no, um, I think, direct significance but beyond so that. I but I, I think it's concerning for the Syrian opposition because it's identifying them with a very bad and f failed um, intervention and, uh, and process, which is very alarming. It, but it is likely, for example, set aside the Western world, Turkey. I mean, Turkey might jump in and have some formulation of some sort in recognizing before any other Arab country. It's perfectly true that there's not going to be a Security Council resolution for intervention in Syria, that's for sure, because of the position of Russia and China. But I think if the process of civil war de does develop, I think the responsibility to protect um, provision could easily be implemented and there are all sorts of scenarios one can imagine where that could take place. But I think your point about Turkey is important because it's happening now. I mean, the, the Turkish government is already opening up to elements of the, armed elements of the, um, of the Syrian opposition. That's happened more clearly in the last few days. And I mean, the, I think there is a risk of a regional proxy war in Syria taking place between Turkey and Iran. This is back to my argument that as soon as we, the international community is unwilling to interfere right now, we have the possibility of civil war. But at, at the end, this, the situation will continue like this. But now, I think it's, it's important to adopt sanctions on Bashar Assad. They already have sanctions. Level Look at Iraq under the sanctions. You had 13 years of sanctions. They didn't do anything to the regime. They destroyed the people. In Iraq, there, there, there wasn't demonstrations. There are now demonstrations. Then Syria is not like rich like in Iraq. Why isn't there demonstrations in the Arab world and elsewhere in support of oppositions in Syria and Yemen? Why are the, the, those Arab countries isolated? Well, I think, first of all, many of these countries are busy with their own revolutions. Yemen, um, to Egypt is still in, in the process. Bahrain, they're sort of busy um, with their own problems. And the ones that aren't, you can't demonstrate in those countries. So you think Tun Tunisia is probably the actual fairy tale, the only way forward for the time being? The optimism that I have, and I have to say I was at some point very, very optimistic, but the optimism that I've left is very much related to Tunisia. I do think that the focus on elections is misplaced. I don't think that elections equate democracy. Often election actually institutionalize all kinds of either sectarian differences mm. or other differences. I'm also still optimistic for Egypt, although I still see, and we haven't talked about it, I mean, for me, one of the key problems is the military and the fact that the big difference between Tunisia and Egypt, of course, is the fact that um, the you know military never played such an important role and you have much more actually of uh, proper revolution, whereas in Egypt, I mean, with all due respect to people there, I don't see that a revolution has happened. What I see there is actually that the old regime is very much still in place. Gentlemen, Nadia. Thanks for joining Empire, and I'll be back with Rashid Ghannoushi, the head of the al Nahda party that has just won the Tunisian elections. Uh, Sheikh Ghannoushi, welcome to Empire. After uh, maybe 40 years of struggle, uh, 
20 years of exile, uh, years in Tunisian prisons. Here you are, the head of a political party that just basically won the elections in Tunisia. No. Yes. Did you expect this to happen no. in your own lifetime? Yes, I was sure this would happen. During the past 22 years, I was expecting free elections to happen at any time. The Nada movement has no competitors. I've always felt like that. Why haven't you been a candidate in the elections? Or you simply had a, a conscious decision not to be involved in the elections and not to be in the next government? Before I went back to Tunisia, I said I had no ambition to become a president, a minister or an MP. It was a personal decision that I'd taken, not that of the movement. I did that because I see that this uprising was undertaken by the young people. All the martyrs are young people, the elders only take the lead. This is why the revolution should be youthful. We're dealing with a revolution which is built on renovation. A revolution staged by young people who should take the lead, while the elderly should take the back seat from where they may give advice and guidance. Only to advise or are you actually leading from above or from behind? I'm now leading directly as I am the party leader. I'm leading at the first row, but I'm not intent on continuing to hold this position, so maybe someone else will take over. I'll not, however, remain unemployed. I'm the Deputy Secretary General of the Association of Muslim Scholars, so I have much to do in the Muslim world. So the Nahda is going to enter into coalition government with secular parties? That's a major step forward. Yeah. Do you think a constitution will be written in consensus among several coalition parties like that soon? The constitution should be written in the spirit of conciliation. This constitution is not for one or even three parties. This constitution is for an entire nation. So it should be written in the spirit of conciliation, not that of the 51%, which means a majority that would impose its will, the constitution should cover a long period, so it should incorporate principles that would live up to a hundred or two hundred years in the future. What would be your opening line when it says, Sharia is, continue the line for me, in the constitution? Sharia is justice. And its role in the state is what? Sharia plays the role of the source of values. It's not a set of exact rules, but it directs us to brotherhood, justice, freedom, equality, humanity. So you, do, so you still think that so-called Islam is the solution for Tunis? Or now you're saying that a civic state with civic values is the future for Tunis? These two matters aren't contradictory. The Islamic system is a civic system. It's not ruled by a church. It follows scholarly guidance. But is this your own interpretation of Islamism? Or because certainly other Islamist movements don't adopt this understanding. That's why there's no one single interpretation of Sharia. Tunisia may adopt a certain understanding of Sharia, while Iran adopts a different one and Pakistan adopts a third one. The concept of Islamism is a very wide one, with different understandings starting from bin Laden up to Erdogan. It's a very wide range. Speaking of those two specific poles, if you will, you think what's happened in this last year is a victory for the non-violent, for the more tolerant Islam rather than the totalitarian Islam like bin Laden? I once said that Al-Qaeda was over in Tunisia. The eruption of the revolution in Tunisia means there is a third way for a change. It's not that of violence. It's not that of integration into the current regimes under the pretext of aiming to reform them, because these regimes cannot be reformed. Changing the internal systems of these regimes failed, and changing them by violence also failed. So the Arab world was going through a state of inactivity. 
Tunisia came up with a third way, which is the peaceful revolution. In one year, three regimes have so far been toppled and two others are on the way to being toppled. This wave will not stop. Sheikh, you were tortured, you were imprisoned, you were exiled. Is there going to be torture in the future Tunisia? Is there going to be exiled people from the future Tunisia? Or is this going to be instated in law that there will be, that Tunis will no longer torture? The constitution must include an article on criminalizing torturers and to consider torture as a crime against humanity. Utmost penalties must be executed against perpetrators of this crime, regardless the ideologies they adopt. Torture is a violation of humanity. There must be national consensus on criminalizing torturers. Another question of economy. If there's going to be no employment and jobs, I think all our talk here is just philosophical. You're perhaps socially conservative, but economically, are you a liberal on the economic level? You want to attract investments and open up the society towards a more capitalist mode of production? We've adopted in our program the system of free social economy, the same system of the market, but within the framework of justice and humanity, not the system of brutal markets. Yes, we encourage free initiatives, but within the framework of humanity. On this uh, encouraging note, Sheikh, thank you. I have seen many victims become victimizers, the prosecuted embracing prosecutors' roles, obsessed by those who had control over their and their families' lives, or determined to never again be subjected to gruesome injustice. They rush to wear their victimizers' outfits, put on their dark sunglasses and earpieces before holding their guns and occupying their torture chambers. Real change doesn't come by substituting national flags and names of internal security services or by growing or shaving beards. It comes by ensuring that past injustice visited upon them isn't repeated under their watch. The humiliating murder of the captured former Libyan leader, Muammar Gaddafi, is a case in point. Well, that's the way it goes. If you have any thoughts or comments, please write to me. Until next time.